So the talk of today is about ovarian stimulation for IVF women in PCOS. So as said as in the previous lecture, the first line treatment is lifestyle change, then ovulation inducing agents, clomifencitrate, insulin sensitizing medication, if there is no conception, we go to gonadotrophin treatment or laparoscopic ovarian drilling with the rule we heard a few minutes ago. If there is no conception, we can move to IVF. So that's to say that the IVF is not the first line therapy of IVF as we see in many times. IVF is the last resort and the indications are after failure of other treatment option, when there is no, when there, when, when there is another infertility factor requiring IVF such as male factors, and PCOS in fact is involved in 33 to 43 of IVF indication. So it's a big part, a big amount of our indications of IVF. What are the problems with IVF and PCOS? There is, there is two problems. A quantitative problem. In fact, we have an excessive number of oocytes and estradiol production that is detrimental, an increased risk of OHSS, and that is the number one problem of uh, ovarian, uh, uh, PCOS ovarian. Increased risk of OHSS is by 6.8 field. And the risk of maternal death is not neglectable in this situation because it's reported to be at least to three per, per 100,000 uh, IVF. So it is an important problem, these quantitative problems. And we see that the difference in number of oocytes retrieved during IVF compared to PCOS patient in match control is much higher. The second problem is a qualitative problem. We also have discomfort for the patient because of the high number and the uh, discomfort of the ovum pickup. The quality of oocytes, the question about the quality, you have a much more immature oocyte. The quality of the embryos also, what's the endometrium with this high level of estradiol and an increased risk of miscarriage that is reported miscarriage. The oocyte fertilized are less important. The duration of stimulation is uh, longer and the cycle cancellation is also more important. Also, as said, in the pregnancies, we have the increase to 3.5 fold the, uh, the rate of miscarriage of the gestational diabetes, of toxemia, preeclampsia, preterm delivery, and perinatal mortality. That's why when you have pregnancy, the rate of pregnancy is not correlated to rate of uh, uh, birth, life uh, of a uh, newborn. Ovulation stimulation for AVF and PCOS. The risks, so how to evaluate the risk, how to proceed. For situation, I will speak, although we don't practice in Tunisia the IVM, but is a lot discussed and in my conclusion about IVM, I will say why we don't use IVM, although it's put on the table. The metformin pretreatment is an, um, an important thing to discuss. Then, in the conventional IVF, we'll discuss gonadotrophin analog and the triggering signal. Then, nowadays, it's up to date to discuss about the segmentation of IVF. The principle of in vitro maturation, as you know, is to avoid stimulation in women at high risk of OHSS, and the oocyte collection from antral follicles of women with PCOS in an unstimulated cycle, so the maturation is done in vitro. And the re results are differently reported. And you see that the pregnancy rates are acceptable, but don't reach the actual standard in IVF from 21 to 31%. And uh, Guzman proposed a uh, selection of the patient and he uh, said that when you have more than eight oocytes, 
you have uh, better ongoing and uh, fresh fresh embryo transfer and cumulative pregnancy rate after the frozen out embryo transfer. So it's better when you do uh, uh, when you do EVM is to have more oocytes and it's usually the case in PCOS. There is a proposition of the freeze all embryo strategy after IVM and it's, it's new because the freeze all strategy is actually new with the improving techniques of vitrification. So in a study of 31 and 50 patients, when you transfer one embryo, you have an, an ongoing pregnancy rate or live birth rate of 61, 60.1. And when you transfer two embryos in subsequent cycles, you have 24% of pregnancy. Of course, the problem of this technique, because you, you touch the oocyte, you maturate in vitro, you probably, as we'll say, create problems. So the miscarriage rate is important in this technique, is a third of the pregnancies. In summary, so IVM is, there's an absence of randomized studies comparing conventional to IVF, to uh, conventional IVF to IVM. Uh, Comparison is only between AVM protocols and three validated, only three validated studies show the absence of evidence to recommend IVM women with PCOS. And recent studies show it, and that is important, that IVM has the deleterious effect on the spindle organization and chromosomal configuration of oocyte from PCOS patient. So I have to, to reflect two times because before beginning this technique, that's why we don't involve in this technique and we prefer to adopt the recommendation of this slide until more evidence is available. IVM may not be preferred in first line of treatment of subfertile women in PCOS. It could be proposed in second line therapy in women with PCOS at very, very high risk of OHSS if you, uh, this technique is available in your labs. An important chapter is the chapter of the metformin pretreatment. It mitigates the impact of metabolic disorder on follicular genesis and on the evolution of pregnancy. So the rationale is that metformin reduces insulin resistance and intraovarian hyperandrogeny. So there's an improvement of the quality of oocytes, the fertilization of the oocytes, and the potential reduction of the risk of OHSS and of the pregnancy complications such as miscarriage and uh, toxemia. But this, all these things are not improved results. So pre and co metformin treatment. Five trials reported by Costello with patients with PCOS. One group with metformin and IVF versus IVF alone. And you see that the less consumption, consumption of gonadotrophin, less estradiol. Number of seed collected is the same with metformin or without metformin. The ongoing pregnancy, uh, the cumulative pregnancy rate is better with metformin and the live birth rate is really increased because we reduce the complication of pregnancy uh, in this case with metformin. Systematic review pre cometformin treatment and in 2030 by Paloma. No effect, he said that there is no effect on the pregnancy rate by, by, by transfer, no effect on the live birth, but a reduction of the risk of OHSS and the reduction of miscarriage risk. So you see that from more than a decade, the results and the conclusion about metformin are not the same by all the authors. You have to do your own choice. Metformin reduces, for sure, the uh, gestational diabetes. Doc, uh, she has, it has a protective effect with metformin, without metformin, and with metformin. In pretreatment, or quoted metformin appears to be beneficial for its protective effect, so there's less risk, and this is for sure, of OHSS, miscarriage, and gestational diabetes. So the, 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 the problem of 
the, the, preg the, the stimulation and the, the quality of oocyte is still debatable. Some people say it, when you change lifestyle, or the person lose weight, you can have better results than adding metformin. And it's, of course, you don't uh, use metformin with very fat patients. You have to make them lose weight before. It's a nonsense. So we have to respect the gradual proposal. proposal. Now, according to conventional IVF, how to stimulate? What is the gonadotropin choice? The response is easy. There is no statistical difference between FSH or HMG. There is diff there are studies in favor of FSH, st studies in favor of HMG, but when you take all the studies and you respect the situation of all uh, patients according to the age, uh, quality of response, the previous response, the previ previous drug used, there is no difference at the end of the day. Which analog to use? Agonist and antagonist. Here things evaluated and the response is relatively clear. Referring to these five studies, the meta analysis of Gressinger, 2006, and the trial of Kolibianakis, uh, Homaiden in 2011, the Cochrane Review of 2011 on human reproduction, and the meta analysis of Xiao in gynecological endocrinology. The results of this population uh, of studies was that we can say now in the woman with PCOS who should be who should be included for IVF it's recommended with a high level of evidence to use antagonist to control ovarian stimulation antagonist more than they are more friendly than agonist there is a shorter duration of stimulation lower gonadotrophin consumption and lower cancellation rate but also it's more safe than agonist. Significantly lower incidence of OHSS, especially after agonist triggering. The risk difference is at least 10%. And also, but it's an important fact, it is as effective as the agonist. Same number of oocyte, the cumulative pregnancy rate is almost the same, life birth rate almost the same, and also there is no increase of miscarriage with agonist. The protocol are known, of course, agonist when you choose to use them because you can, if you want, and you, you, you think that you can manage your stimulation without going through hyperstimulation syndrome, you can manage with decapeptyl or other agonists you have. And after down regulation begin, the agonist, the dose, the dose can be uh, lower than 150. Of, with agonist, with the menstruation, with or without pretreatment, you can begin your uh, stimulation. Of course, here the pretreatment is leave it in your choice because you know that PCOS, that they are spaniomenorrhea, they have absence of menstruation, so you can give her the menstruation by giving a progestin for 10 days and then begin your stimulation. Which triggering signal? Here also things evaluated. There is a lot of studies. 1,660 that is reporting how to trigger with GNRH, HCG, GNRH agonist, HCG, only GNRH agonist, GNRH, HCG. In the uh, new studies, since Homaidan does his publication to trigger with uh, agonist and to support the luteal phase, as we see. So the results are uh, different, but the Commitment is that we don't have any hyperstimulation when we trigger with agonist. But the results of the first studies are this. In fact, it still be, remain some hyperstimulation. According to the publication of Humaidan, according to the uh, triggering ovulation with agonist, you see that with the standard luteal phase support, you have less pregnancy when you trigger ovulation with the uh, agonist uh, with the same luteal phase support. But when you adjust your luteal phase support by adding 1,500 unit of HCG the day of the of a pickup, you will adjust your result 
probably by an effect of this ICG on the steroid secretion, the progesterone secretion in the uh, luteal phase to improve the luteal phase and to improve the ability of the endometrium for implantation. And the question, we try to avoid HCG, but we add HCG. Of course, uh, the studies showed that there is less less ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, and the, the number reported was zero. But in fact, in the studies reported by Humaydan himself, with triggering with uh, HCG, agonist with HCG, there is still 1.6% uh, of hyperstimulation syndrome. So it's, it's a good technique, a good way to diminish the risk of hyperstimulation, but it's not, it's not the way to avoid it 100%. The IVF segmentation, that is also a good strategy. You have, of course, inclusion criteria, the indication of IVF ICSI, presence of PCOS, match follicles, stimulation under antagonist control, agonist triggering, all these uh, steps make you comfortable with the PCOS, OCID collection, and you preserve, cure preserve all. At different stage, you can do this at OCID storage, pronuclei, embryo stage, blastocyst stage, according to your uh, lab facilities, and the embryo transfer is delayed in the dowing cycle, hormonal substitution with estrogen, progesterone, of course, we use this way because it's difficult to use the transfer, the trans cycle, uh, with natural cycle because of the bad maturation and the, uh, the bad cycle you have, and you have spanium menorrhea. It's difficult to uh, reach uh, naturally the dominant follicle with PCOS patients. So this strategy with freezing all at the pronuclear stage, according to Kolibianakis, gives you first transfer 38% and the cumulative after the other transfer of the other blastocyst uh, pronuclei, you have 68.3. Quite good result. Gressinger reported at the embryo stage 31 for the first transfer, 36 for the cumulative pregnancy rate. And Herrero, Herrero that was at the blastocyst stage, reported 50% of pregnancy replacing the embryo at the subsequent cycle. So, hormonal substitution also, we said it, and the risk of OHSS, of course, is zero when you uh, freeze all the oocyte or all the blastocyst. So, in conclusion, for the association between PCOS and IVF, the chances of pregnancy are similar between women in PCOS and women without PCOS after IVF treatment when you use all your tools you have to manage this situation. Because when we are used to do high first line IVF, I said, young doctors in centers of uh, IVF, and they use it to uh, do stimulation with male factor or tubal factor. When you have a PCOS, the way of thinking is different, and the way of stimulating is different. You have to have all the complication in mind to avoid this. And it's better to cancel and cycle than to go ahead in an hyperstimulation syndrome that is a very detrimental situation, either for the patient or for the doctor. Pretreatment with metformin appears to improve the quality of pregnancy, but not pregnancy achievement. The antagonist protocol should be the treatment of choice of ovarian stimulation because it is more friendly and more safer. In addition, it offers the possibility to use agonist for triggering the phenyl oocyte maturation to reduce the risk of OHSS. Segmentation of ovarian stimulation by replacement of HCG with GnRH agonist for triggering phenyl oocyte maturation appears to be an attractive option since it improves the probability of pregnancy and emulates the occurrence of OHSS. Thank you for attention.